Hello and welcome to the Waking Up to Grace podcast, where we celebrate and explore the finished work of our Lord, Jesus Christ. The Waking Up to Grace podcast can be found on every major platform. And now, here's Lenny. Today we're going to talk about 1 John 1, 9. We're going to take a closer look at that passage. A lot of people may not realize this, but today's doctrines have led a lot of people down a, a road of confusion, and maybe people don't even realize it, how confusing it actually is. But this passage, being understood correctly, could actually shed a completely different light on the scripture when you read it and open your eyes to a meaning that you didn't even realize was there before. And, uh, you know, you guys can listen in and see what you think about it. If you've ever uh, been released from legalism, you probably know about this one because it was probably holding you in bondage at one point. Uh, so let's uh, let's get into it. Uh, shall I read or, or shall Melissa read? Would you like to read, Melissa? Sure, I'll read. You're a good reader. That's 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 uh, good for that. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll just read the the first chapter here. Most of the first chapter, start, stopping at verse ten, so we can shed some good context and listen carefully to what's being said and and uh, how who they're addressing who they're talking to in regards to, are they talking to people that are having fellowship with them or people that they want to share fellowship with them, meaning that some of the audience doesn't currently have fellowship. So there, you know, is there a mixed audience or is everybody there a Christian and was this written directly to Christians and that's it. So let's just think about that when we read this passage. Go ahead, Melissa. All right. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you that we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. The blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. Okay. What was John proclaiming to his audience here then? What would you guys say he was proclaiming? You know, he starts out saying that they were proclaiming something. What, what was he proclaiming? He was proclaiming concerning the word of life, which is Christ. So he was proclaiming about Christ. So and he, they were proclaiming what they had seen with their own eyes, what they had looked at, and their hands had touched. So this is apostolic. You know, they're, they walked and, and talked and, you know, possibly hugged Jesus. They, they were with him. And so they're, they're proclaiming that he was real, that he, he walked on the earth, and they're, they're proclaiming Christ. You know, and so who's the audience? What's the audience as far as heritage? You know, John was an apostle to the Jews. He didn't travel around like Paul to the Gentiles. So it would have been a predominantly Jewish audience. And they're proclaiming Jesus. Right. Right. So why would they why would they be doing that to if they were speaking to a group of Christians? I say they wouldn't. Yeah. And so, I mean, it's, it'd be kind of interesting to start proclaiming Christ and some of the things that they've procl they're proclaiming here to a, a group of Christians. Right. So right. there's there's certainly, um, you know, some questions that's questionable there. You're like, OK, so was it can we hands down say this passage was written to Christians? Y you can't. And, you know, Especially there's... since it says 
the apostles are saying, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. Yeah. So the, the audience does not yet have fellowship. Yeah. With so, them. so John was saying he's proclaiming this so right. that you may have fellowship with us. He's telling the audience, we want you to have fellowship with us. So it sounds kind of like evangelism. You know, if you were to share your faith with somebody, you'd say, you might say it like that. You know, at least in those days, I'm proclaiming this to you so you can have fellowship with us. Do you know about Jesus? And their fellowship, he says, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Okay, yeah, exactly. That was going to be my next question to you. Who who was John's fellowship with? And you just answered it. Their fellowship was, was with the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ. So they're proclaiming this fellowship to the audience so that may they may have fellowship with them, right? right. So, so that's interesting. If we look at who he's speaking to, and we're looking at, okay, he's speaking to people who are, are uh, Jewish non-Christians are proclaiming the Messiah to these people so that they can have fellowship with them, because these people didn't understand that, you know, the Jewish people didn't understand that, at least many of them didn't, some of them may have heard whispers of it, you know, of what's going on, but they did not have fellowship with them. So when you look at the next passage, we write this to make our joy complete. Yeah, so they, you know, why was he proclaiming the fellowship? To, to make their joy complete. Not all the people had fellowship. We've clarified that. Yeah, that just wouldn't make sense. So it kind of sounds like, again, you know, a, an evangelistic passage, doesn't it? Does, does anybody, you know, have any doubts here about this being a passage of evangelism? It sounds like he's reaching out to people to share Jesus with them, his, his fellow Jewish brothers, right? I, Sounds like that makes perfect sense. Right. It, it seems very clear. I, he would not say, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. Yeah. He wouldn't say that if they already had it. Yeah. Okay. And then we look at uh, some of the deeper parts of the passage where he says, God is light in him. There is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. And so we'll hit on that later. He actually gets more into the fellowship issue and in some different passages, but just put that on hold for right now. We're going to talk about fellowship and how it is to be in the light or in the darkness. But then he says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Okay, so the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin if we walk in the light as he is in the light. So he's trying to share with them that we can gain purity from all of our sin. Then he says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So if you're denying sin, like, oh, or you're denying uh, your own sin, even, you're deceiving yourselves. So, you know, we all know that we have sin. You'd have to be pretty self-righteous to say that you stopped or that you don't, you know, or that you're some kind of perfect person. And then he says, uh, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And this is, this is the passage that you hear being justified as asking God perpetually for forgiveness. Where, uh, you know, we're to keep, continue analyzing ourselves on a daily basis, looking and, and finding our sin and confessing it to God in order to get forgiven. And this is something that, you know, we're to do daily, it's told, and maybe even to log it in a log book, I've heard. To keep log, like keep a journal and always remember your sins. I've heard a preacher say, because God gave us a memory so that we can remember and so that we don't forget where we came from. And, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of talk about, you know, this, this uh, meditating on our sin as Christians. But is that what this passage is saying? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, purifies us from all unrighteousness. Now, if you confessed your sin to God, and, we, and just prior to that, it said claiming to be without sin. So you have these people claiming to be without sin. And then a passage after, let's just jump into there. He says, if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. So he's right around that passage. He's talking about two different outlooks, people that think they haven't sinned or claim they haven't sinned. 
And then there's the people that realize they've sinned. And how do we realize that we've sinned? The mirror of the law <laughs> has has been reflected on on us for years. And then uh, you know, if you were if you were Jewish, so the Jewish people know more than anybody that they're sinners. They ought to at least. The Pharisees are probably the ones that you know were probably trying to convince people you can achieve this level that's pleasing to God, right? But uh, 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all righteousness. So if you, if you stop going around being self-righteous and confess, Lord, I'm a sinner, <laughs> I need a savior, he's faithful and just and will forgive us the sin and purify us from all unrighteousness. So how much unrighteousness is left in you after that? How much righteousness is left to be forgiven after that one confession? None. Do you think you can be purified from more than all unrighteousness? No. It's, it seems impossible. It would be impossible to get any more purified than that. Right. So, you know, what we learn, and it's the same with the with the word repentance, is that it's a one-time thing. And basically what you're what you're doing is saying, I am a sinner, I need a savior. Yeah. That's what you're doing. You're not sitting there with this long list that you've journaled. Right. The point is, no matter what, even if you've managed to overcome some big sins you might have made, you know, maybe you've been divorced, maybe you, uh, maybe you murdered somebody, even if you <laughs> managed to stop doing those oh. things, you're never gonna stop being angry, which is the same as murder in right. God's eyes. See, but what, so, but what you're hitting on is the, is the mindset that the Christians have looking at this passage. So if your mindset going into this passage is that it's, it's, you know, this is written to Christians and it's about asking for forgiveness, then you see that, okay, there's an example in the scripture about confession. That's what the Catholics call it. They call it confession. They do it to a priest and then the priest represents them on behalf of God, to God. And then as uh, Protestants, we're told that we can go straight to God and ask for forgiveness on a regular basis. These but this are... is this is a cleansing cycle. But this These passage... Those are religious rituals. Right. Because this passage mm -hmm. doesn't say that. That's the point. This passage has nothing to do with that. Right. It's, com it's completely ridiculous to pull that out of this passage. And Christianity is not a religion. It's a faith. Right. There's no need for religious rituals any so, longer. So let's just say, okay, well, maybe we're overreacting here. There's examples of, of people asking for forgiveness in the Bible. Well, show me one in the New Testament. You're, you're not going to find one. And the, under the new covenant, if it was so important that we ask for forgiveness to God to cleanse ourselves on a regular basis, I'm not saying realizing you're a sinner. That's a, it's a healthy thing to realize you're a sinner, but the spirit of God guides us away from sin and, and teaches us. And so that's a whole nother story. We have to have faith in the spirit, not in our log books. But if it was so important that we did this ritual of cleansing where we ask for forgiveness. Don't you think one of the, just one of the apostles would have written about it? Just one. Of course. And there's no evidence of it anywhere in scripture, anywhere in the new covenant. So are we living in the old covenant when we do that? Not to mention there, well, there are so many supporting passages that it's quite the opposite, that we're not to sit and log and dwell and have guilt. And when we're reading the Bible, we always have to remember to test the spirit. The spirit will lead us to all truth. And we always have to remember to be looking for truth. Amen. And what do we know? We know that God remembers our sins no more. When we, re when we believe, when we realize we're a sinner in need of a savior and he comes into our heart, he remembers our sins no more. So why wouldn't we follow his example? Yeah, you're quoting Hebrews. And then uh, why would we sit there and continue to remember when our father is no longer? He doesn't want that. And if anybody out there is really doubting and just saying, you know what, I've there's nothing wrong with asking a holy God for his forgiveness. Let's just take a look at this passage in Hebrews, because Hebrews uh, kind of sets this straight <laughs> on how forgiven we actually are. It says, so even the first covenant was inaugurated with blood. For when Moses had spoken every command to all the people, according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop 
and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people and said, it is the blood of the covenant that God has commanded you to keep. He just announced, he said that the first covenant, even the first covenant was inaugurated in blood. And so he's describing how that happened. And he, the reason he's saying even the first is because the second, as we know, the second covenant was inaugurated in blood. And we, we talk about that in our new covenant studies. You know, when did the new covenant begin? It was with the blood of Jesus. And then he goes on and he says, in both the tabernacle and all the utensils of worship, he likewise sprinkled with blood. Indeed, according to the law, almost everything was purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So both covenants were established in blood, the first and the second. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So what we see here is that God uses blood to start his covenants. The first and the second covenant were signed with blood, the law of, of blood, I guess you could say. There, there is no forgiveness without this shedding of blood. It's a blood shedding thing that God used to start these covenants. I don't know uh, the perfect what words to eloquently describe this, but you can't get forgiveness any other way. So if you're truly in your, in your heart asking God for forgiveness, where are you shedding the blood? You think you're misunderstanding how God's covenants work because there has to be bloodshed. So in the old covenant, they used bulls and goats. They used animals. And it was perpetual. It was over and over. And then in Hebrew says that Christ entered into the sanctuary once and for all to make the final sacrifice. So one sacrifice made for all, and it was final. There's no longer a perpetual forgiveness. The, his blood covered everything. Just think about that. You know, next time, you know, if, if you're still in the habit of asking forgiveness and, you know, you think, well, what's the harm? Just think on that a little. Christ shed his blood once and for all. There was bloodshed, and that's what God needed. That's what he needed for your forgiveness so that he could make you right. And you've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus once and for all. So is asking for that, is asking for more of that and watering down the blood of Christ to make it look like it's not even as good as the animals that they sacrificed. I mean, they would be forgiven for a year under the old covenant. And now we're going to log our sins on a regular basis. And we're going to we're going to remind God who, as you had said, has told us that he remembers our sins no more. Are we going to are we going to log him for him and we're going to remind him? <laughs> Here, here's my sin that I'm not sure if the blood of Jesus covered. How much of our sin can the blood of Jesus cover? How potent is the blood of Jesus compared to the bulls and goats? Does it need to be yearly, daily, or is it forever, like the Bible teaches? That's what the Bible teaches. And with what you've just said there, if if we are someone who thought it was respectful and loving and just what you do, just the right thing to do to be asking God for forgiveness. And every time you sin, what was just said should really make you think on that because it's actually quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. It's doubting, it's unbelief, it's disrespectful, it's a slap in the face. He gave <laughs> us the most amazing, the most beautiful, the most precious gift ever. And we're sitting there asking for more, for it again. But it's the understanding of that gift. You hear this message of freedom and you think, okay, well, you, you know, a lot of pastors would say you can't teach that stuff. You're going to make people go out and sin. The question here is, do those pastors have faith in the spirit of God or do they have faith in mankind and in the flesh? Because if you're keeping people under rules in order to teach them behavior, that's not the spirit. If you're teaching people freedom, like the Bible teaches us, and that we're free from our sin, that we've been cleansed, the part that you got to teach next is the life in Christ, what it means to have Christ living in and through us. That's, that is the magic. Why would anybody, you know, want to want to continue in, in sin when they fully understand grace and what they have in Christ? Like you said, it's not just a realization. It's a life transformation that the Spirit of God does in us. You literally get a new heart, and it's literally the heart of Christ. We're not in charge of transforming ourselves. We're not in charge of logging all our sins and attaining perfection. That's where Israel failed. The things that they were trying to attain through their works, Paul said, 
the Gentiles were able to obtain through faith. They were given it. It was given to them, and now they're transformed by the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit has changed them. The Spirit of God has changed them, not the spirit of legalism. The spirit of legalism is a lie. There's only a few elements that can lie, and Satan was master deceiver. You know, before he was destroyed, he left his legacy on the earth, and mankind is in the flesh. That's all we can do is lie and be against God, but the Spirit of God changes us. My dad actually asked a good question, pointing out the fact that there's not even any mention of asking for forgiveness in this passage in 1 John 1. It doesn't actually even say ask for forgiveness. It just says if we confess our sins to him. And so what is a confession? You know, if you were to ask a murderer for their confession, you're asking them to admit that they did it, to admit you're guilty. If you admit you're guilty rather than denying you're guilty of sin, because you got to right. see it from God's vantage point, as Melissa said, to repent, you have to see things from God's view. And that's what the Spirit of God teaches us to do. We start to see things from His point of view. So if we admit we're sinners, then our change of mind comes into play. But once you've once your mind has been changed, you've been made right with God and the blood of Jesus Christ, which is the most potent, perfect blood ever shed on this earth has washed you clean. What's left to admit? Do you still have something to admit to God for? You shouldn't because you've said, I'm a sinner. I have sin in my life and I need a savior. Does God really not know? I mean, he says he will remember it no more. You're forgiven as far as he's from the West. Do we really need to remind him anymore? He knows that we realized our sin. As Christians, the spirit of God is teaching us how to live upright lives. The grace of God, according to uh, what Paul wrote in Titus, is what teaches us to live upright lifestyles. Paul actually wrote that the law increases sin. And so if we want more sin in our lives, let's log our sins and let's follow rules like that. Let's create our own rules. Kind of like the big sign that says, whatever you do, do not push this big red button. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So do you want to log your sins and increase your sin more? Do you want to focus on your sin? Do you want to meditate on it day and night when you could be doing what the scripture actually teaches and focusing on Christ and his glory and his splendor and what he's done for you and just say, thank you, Lord, that that's amazing grace. Thank you. Thank you. I want to do what the scripture tells us. And ever since the Lord brought us to this realization, I have never felt so much peace. Yeah. Which is a big reason why we're doing this. And I mean, we want truth out there, but we want everyone to have that peace. There is no peace in being constantly under guilt and constantly feeling like you don't know if you've been forgiven. There's none. Yeah. You can't experience the abundant life no. in Christ if you're if you haven't settled the sin issue. The sin issue is critical. We have to realize this in order to be able to go on to maturity as Christians and stop suckling on spiritual milk and eat meat. You know, we, we need to be able to read the Bible and take in the the meat of the scripture and understand what the meat is, the depths of God's love is what the meat is. That's what feeds us spiritually. It's the depths of God's love. And how can you understand the depth of his love if he's constantly in your mind still punishing you and still looking down at you and still judging you on a regular basis? That part's over. The reason we don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit is because it's part of us. It is us. We're one with God's spirit. The spirit of Jesus Christ is living inside of us. We've been made one with that. And so what are we doing if we're not focusing on that and we're focusing on stupid things and wrapping ourselves up in sin? What good is it? It it's, certainly doesn't. It's a distraction. Feel, yes, and it certainly doesn't feel good anymore. First of all, in the Gospel of John, it talks about that, how the Spirit is in us and we are in the Spirit. And we've heard it said that once Christ, you have his heart and he's living in you, it just doesn't feel so good to drag him around over into your sin. <laughs> yeah, you. When you know he's right there with our you. Our heart has changed. And the more our minds are renewed, the more we wake up to realize. Sometimes our minds will make us think that we want to sin, but our hearts are never producing that. 
because Christ is in our hearts and, and our heart is teaching our mind. The sin doesn't come from our hearts. It comes from a lack of uh, renewing of the mind. And so as we are still part of this fallen world. Right. And so why did Paul say be transformed by the renewing of your minds? It was because that's how we're taught by grace as he said in Titus, that we learn from grace to live upright lifestyles. It's the renewing of our minds that learn to follow our heart. And we start to understand what's in our heart. We start to realize what the Savior did for us, what God did for us, and who he is, and how much he loves us. And, you know, they, they don't say, cry out, Abba, Father, meaning Daddy, Father, for nothing. I mean, he's Daddy. You can come to him with anything, and you can come to him always knowing that he fully accepts you fully accepts you. He's not counting anything against you. It's like the ultimate perfect relationship, uh, only because he's made it that way. But, you know, we're actually talking about fellowship here. So let's, let's dig into the out of fellowship as described in 1 John 1, 9, because he talks about fellowship. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness. We lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins and admit that we're sinful, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claimed we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Is God light? And is there any darkness in him at all? According to this passage. He is light and there is no darkness in him at all. So if you have fellowship with him, as they're declaring, they want them to have fellowship with them who is with the father and with the son. That means there will be no darkness in you at all. You'll no longer be in the darkness. Right. So can we have fellowship with God and, and walk in the darkness? No. No, it would be impossible because there's no darkness in him at all. So when you have fellowship with him, you become part of the light. You can't walk in the darkness at all anymore. It says if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. So you're not living out the truth. You don't have the truth. You don't understand the truth if you're still walking around in darkness. In other words, not understanding the gospel. You know, you're in the dark. The gospel sheds light on your life. It's the light. Christ is the light of the world. So what if, let's say you have, you're a Christian and you have a friend who says they're a Christian. You guys go to church together. And all of a sudden, your friend starts telling you about how every uh, Saturday night they're going out and they're being unfaithful mm -hmm. to their husband or wife. and they seem just fine with it and they're still coming to church. They still proclaim to be a Christian. Would you say that they have fallen out of fellowship? You just said that they seem just fine with it. Mm -hmm. So they're clearly not uh, realizing their sin. According to if we claim to be without sin, we have deceived ourselves and the truth is not in us. Or if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. So Maybe maybe his view, this person you're describing, maybe their view on sin is wrong, and maybe they've never really fully re repented in the way that they really realized that they were a sinner and really reached out to the Savior. Could be that. But like we had talked about in a past study, you know, if, if you're going to base your fellowship on your, on your deeds and works, then all of them have to be perfect. Right. So we can't judge it solely on that. The Apostle Paul would have brought them back around to the truth of the gospel and tried to wake them up through a real repentance, you know, 
a real like, changing of come on did you do you realize how you know if they were a christian do you realize how far you came from you'd have to figure out what's going on and what they're thinking in order right. to help them it's Maybe. not a matter of correcting their behavior it's it's a matter of what they're thinking it could be that they bless you by the way yeah i'm sorry no. And so it could also be that, you know, they might be justifying it in some way and torturing themselves because it doesn't feel good anymore to sin when you're a believer and you can yep. fake it that you're fine. But yeah, so there's there's different could be, answers. There could be a lot of pain in, in the heart of that person. Right. You there's know, we, different, people get wrapped up in things. There's different reasons, you know, different uh, answers to what could be going on. But one of them is not that they are a Christian and they have that they were a Christian and they fell away mm -hmm. because that biblically we're told that doesn't happen but the bottom line based on what you brought up there is that you know we're, we're not going to be judging this person based on their actions we have to find out what their understanding of the gospel is and if you were going to help that person you would help lead them to grace to understanding because there's probably something in their thinking that's off that uh, God hasn't renewed their minds on or maybe they just never were in the first place it's hard to say but, you know, I'm not going to say that because of their actions. We would have to find out more because, you know, Christians still sin mm -hmm. physically. We were just reading about Christians walking in darkness. We can't. We can't walk in darkness anymore. And so it, actually in Second John chapter 1, he talks about this fellowship thing. He says, to the lady chosen by God and to her children, whom I love in the truth, not I only, but also all who know the truth because of the truth, which lives in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son will be with us in truth and love. So he's saying that the, the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. You know, clarifying that with verse 1-6, we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness. We lie and do not live out the truth. We aren't a believer if we walk in darkness. This is the point of that. Can you see the connection there? And walking in darkness, that means unbelief. Yeah. And so he's saying the truth is not in us. What's the truth? The truth is Christ. Right. Basically, what he's saying is that if you're walking around in darkness still, you haven't received the truth. You didn't get the message. And so that could be what your example of this guy going around having affairs, that could be the case. He could be claiming to, to be a Christian but not have the truth right? or he, his mind is just not renewed. You know, maybe some saint will come along and help him through God's grace. And God has to teach us. All of our teaching comes from God. We need to, we need to get our updates from God. It's not something, you know, if we start putting our choosing into that mix and faith in our choices into that mix, we don't do any good to anybody at all. I just think it's important to point out that the darkness is unbelief. And with my example there, I know people have asked me time and again, questions about that. Like, well, this person goes to the boat and gambles regularly. So they must be in darkness. So they must not be a Christian, but they said they were, so they must have fell away. But no, we have to realize darkness is unbelief. Right. So Pure if you're unbelief. if you're judging that person, you're actually just casting a stone. Jesus right. said, let he who has no sin cast the first stone. So you're looking at a prostitute and judging her. But, uh, you know, another thing Jesus said is uh, judging your the speck in your brother's eye when you have a log in your own. So, I mean, even as Christians, those words can have a meaning because you're going around judging other people's actions. It's not the actions that we're looking at as Christians. Of course, we're going to persuade each other to go on in love. But why? Why are their actions so bad? Why are their actions not right? You got to go into something spiritual in order to learn more about that. You have to learn more about where they're at spiritually because the Spirit of God doesn't work through law. And, you know, that that's how we help each other as Christians is by speaking spiritual. They need Christ in order to correct them in order for it to stick yes so according to verse 1 8 if we claim to be without sin it's the truth in us and verse 1 8 says if we claim to be without sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us if we claim to be without sin we're claiming we have no need for a savior yeah so we have no gospel 
if we're going around claiming to be without sin. And so, you know, if you, if you ask another Christian, and I've, I've actually had this happen once before, we were at a Bible study and I asked the leader, do you have sin? And do you still sin? And his response was not that I'm aware of. That's concerning. You know, I wasn't asking him in, in the eyes of God. I was asking him in actuality. John's saying the truth isn't in us if we claim that. What did we just learn having the truth in us means? It means the gospel. According to verse 110, if we claim we have not sinned, is his word in us? No. We make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. His word is his promise. His word is Christ. Christ is the promise. So if we claim we have not sinned, when we sin, we're just lying, making them out to be a liar. People out there justifying sin, there's a lot of that going on these days. People proclaiming different sins are, it's okay because it's the, the common lingo out there is that if it's good for you, then good for you, it's bad for me, you know, whatever. But you're calling God a liar. If you're doing something that the scripture tells you is a sin and you're saying it's not, then the truth is not in you. If you're going to lead somebody and you're going to teach somebody scripture and you're justifying sin, you're deceiving people. That's just a, a terrible thing because you're making God out to be a liar in front of your whole audience. So, I mean, the bottom line is, can we be regenerated? Can we have the Holy Spirit if we refuse to acknowledge how God sees our sin? No. We can't. You have to acknowledge it. You have to realize you need a savior. So there's this interesting thing where he forgives you of everything. But it's not until we realize it. And so there's a change of heart, like we've described. And God you... changes your heart. Then you see what's going on. What they're teaching you is, is a true repentance. What they're teaching is a, a true transition. When you really realize sin and you really realize your need for the Savior, that's how you're born again. And so what they're telling us here is if you're going around denying these things, if you're going around acting like sin isn't sin and promoting sin and saying, oh, sin is the is the new thing. Uh, you're old school. You got to start believing that sin is cool like us. Let it all hang out kind of thing. And that's not how you're regenerated. That's not how you're born again. And so if you're a pastor teaching those things, all you're doing is allowing your audience to continue spiritually dead. How can we have life? You have to be taught life by somebody who has it. So if your pastor doesn't have spiritual life, you're not going to learn about spiritual life from him. Take an examination of, of what's out there. Th does this person have spiritual life? Pray for the Holy Spirit to show you. Yeah, amen. I think we know what it means to be out of fellowship, out of walk in the darkness, not walk in the light. You can't be in and out of it. It's not something we bounce in and out of every day and God's happy with us one minute and mad at us the next. What we're reading here in this passage in John is that it's a permanent fellowship and that it, it's beautiful and that we're in light, not in darkness. In the darkness, you're going to stumble over things all the time. So now we're going to take a look at an even closer look at what it means to be in fellowship as described in 1 John 1.9. So, I mean, what we see is this 1 John 1.9 passage is fascinating, actually, and pretty amazing. When you, when you realize that this passage is generally used to teach us to uh, constantly be guilty towards God and asking him for forgiveness and trying to cleanse ourselves on a regular basis to, to give ourselves more righteousness, more good standing with God so that we can stay in fellowship with him and not be out of fellowship. When we realize that that's not what it's about, the passage actually has a whole new meaning, and it's actually a, a wonderful chapter, the chapter of 1 John leading up to 1 John 1, 9. We'll start out by reading it again. 1 John chapter 1 starts out, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you may also have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is a message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light 
as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us of all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. So according to verse 17, what happens when we walk in the light? And in verse 170 says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son purifies us from all sin. So when we walk in the light, we're purified. We have fellowship. And so how much of our sin is purified if we walk in the light? All of it. He purifies us from all sin. All of it. And it's not just up to that point, and then you got to keep track after that. It's, it's all of it. He would certainly specify if he meant right now and then from there on out you better be held accountable because Jesus is still alive and watching you, you know, but he didn't say that. He said all of it. So according to verse 1-9, what happens when we confess? What happens when we admit to God that we're sinners? I'm a sinner and I need a savior. What, what happens? He forgives us and purifies us from all unrighteousness. And there again, how much unrighteousness? All of it. All of it. All of it. After you become a Christian, you're purified from all of it. What you see out in religion, what's popular is that once you become a Christian, you're held to a higher standard and a higher law. Now you have to, you know, journal and monitor and uh, analyze yourself before you take communion. And, and they've turned communion into this terrible thing where you're like mournfully telling God about how bad you were before you received the communion, which was actually supposed to be a celebration of Christ. They turned a celebration into this mournful sobbing fest, or, you know, some people in the audience are even crying because of the sin in their life. But what we have here is the opposite. This is a beautiful message. As soon as you become a Christian, you've been purified of all unrighteousness. And in other passages, he tells us that God takes our unrighteousness and gives us the righteousness of Christ in exchange. I mean, what an exchange that is. <laughs> That's amazing. And so how much sin is left? How much sin is left to be forgiven after this? How much of our unrighteousness is purified at this time? This is crazy. It's all taken care of, isn't it? So how would we go back into the darkness after being fully purified, forgiven, and brought into the light? How could we go back into the darkness? Start just believing. Exactly. Unbelief would be the only way to be in darkness. But once we believe, we can't go back into the darkness. It's permanent. We have eternal security. Once we're in the light, we're in the light. There's no darkness in God at all. Is 1 John 1, 9 teaching the audience the need to realize sin in order to be saved? And yeah, that's what we were talking about. We need to realize it. We need to admit it and understand it from God's perspective. And that's how we get salvation. That's how we're born again, is when God opens our eyes and we see, you know, the horrifying sin that, and uh, we wake up and like, wow, I, I need a savior. But God, you know, God has to call on us to, for us to see that. Can a person be born again if they don't agree with God? We, we talked about this on the last one. You can't. So you have to understand your sin. So does 1 John 1, 9 say to ask for forgiveness or to confess your sin to God? And is confession the same as admitting? So the answer is that he does not say to ask. We talked about this on the second one too, but just to reiterate, just to make sure to drive the point home, he's saying confess, and that's an admittance. That's to admit. Once you become a Christian, you've been cleansed, and God said, I'm no longer going to remember your sins. You're, you've been made perfect forever. Would you want to remind God? Would you, do you want to admit to God that you're a sinner anymore? What would you be admitting to God if you admitted to him that you're a sinner in need of a savior? You'd be admitting that you don't believe from a scriptural vantage point. If you think that process through, you're admitting that you're not a believer. You're admitting that you don't have faith in the blood of Jesus Christ that cleansed you. You're kind of going back again to repentance that you had in the first place. And how do you go back again? How many times was Jesus crucified for your sins? 
In Hebrews, he says he was crucified once for all. He was the ultimate sacrifice. And so there's no longer any need to continue to ask because we already have it. We're asking for something we already have. If my wife of 20 years now has one day asked me, like, are you going to get me a wedding ring? I would look at her like, what do you mean? <laughs> I gave you a wedding ring. <laughs> It, wouldn't that be a little odd? And it's it's kind of the same scenario, except even more severe. He put himself under the crucifixion so that he could cleanse us from all of our sins and then rose from the dead to give us new life. And we're going to ask him for forgiveness all over again and go back to the cross instead of focusing on the life. What we really need as Christians is to move on to the life of Christ and move on to grace and move on to the teachings of the Spirit that the apostles taught and how to live by the Spirit. And in the, in the beginning, we may need to be helped along a little bit because there's so much trash out there when it comes to doctrine, to be honest with you, you know, just lightly speaking. it's There's just trash. It's not teaching you anything about life and what you need to do to live in Christ. Bottom line, God is amazing. God's grace is amazing. And we we want you to have it. When you look at 1 John 1, 9, start questioning, start asking more questions, start, start digging in and finding out what is my church building teaching about 1 John 1, 9? Maybe I'm going to talk to my pastor about it and and see wh why they're teaching me these things about perpetually needing more forgiveness from God when uh, the scripture clearly is not teaching us that from that passage. What scriptural testimony are they going to? Are they, are they going to the Old Covenant where David in Psalms was crying out, wishing that he had what we have today, a full forgiveness, a full perfect standing with God? He would, he would, he would have the, make these great prophecies, and, and God, the, the Spirit, would come on to him temporarily, and then it would leave again, and he'd be left feeling guilty. But uh, the, but Hebrews teaches us if if uh, if those sacrifices that they made under the old covenant had actually cleaned them the way the blood of Christ does with us, that they have no longer felt guilty for their sins. And he's talking about towards God. The scripture wouldn't say something so silly like, oh, we're no longer going to feel bad. We can beat each other up, smack each other around, and oh, I don't feel anything. I feel good about it. That's not what they're saying. They're talking about towards God. We're talking about standing before a holy God in perfection, all the glory. We're, we're seated at the, at the right hand with Christ, according to scripture. I mean, we are in heavenly places now. We need to go beyond the forgiveness issue and look further into this grace thing, this uh, life in Christ that we have so that we can really enjoy our relationship with Christ. And if that, if that means walking away from what is mainstream and normal to us, Sometimes that's just what you got to do, you know, but you got to do what you have to do. There's no perfect answer. You know, my pastor is teaching it all wrong. I, I'm under legalism. Uh, what do I do? Well, you got to pray about that because we live in a world of spiritually terrible teachings. If you want to live life in the spirit, you got to move on. And you're not gaining anything. If you're not learning anything where you're at, then go somewhere else. We're going to end this one. I think we uh, covered everything with 1 John 1, 9 exhaustively, really. We went through that whole chapter, first part of the chapter, three times now. I know in the beginning, it's tough when God's just starting to open our eyes to these things. It's, you can get really hung up on what you've been taught, and it's hard to let that go. Got to clear our minds of that stuff and look at it with fresh eyes and see what God's telling us in this scripture. And so I hope this has helped. Thank you for joining us today. This podcast is brought to you by Waking Up to Grace Ministries. You can visit our blog page, add comments, or reach us privately from our contact form at wakinguptograce.com.